Guys, we are trying this one more time. Rachel has changed um, areas, so we shall see if this works. <laughs> you are back. Um, thank you. If you are new, welcome to the Worth Your Time podcast with me. Um, you know, the great thing about doing it several times is that I start feeling um, a little bit more uh, comfortable on a live video. So here we are. Uh, let's try it. Rachel's coming on. We're going to see if there's a better connection. If there's not, we'll just add um, and try again another time, but we shall see how this goes. She's going to be coming on and I uh, just let her in the room. So fingers crossed. Hi. Hi. So sorry. No, it's not. It's not your fault. It happens. Um, I don't know. You're still looking pretty foggy to me. Is it foggy or just slow? It's, it done. looks, I mean, it, it's like pixelated. <laughs> okay. It but it be. seems better. It seems better. It does, at oh. least for a while. We can see what happens. Okay, okay. Let me, let me start us over. Um, okay. Just because um, if this audio works, then this is what I'll use for the podcast. <laughs> 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 All right, everyone. Um, we are back at the Worth Your Time podcast. I'm your host, Erica, and I'm talking today with Rachel Pia Jones. She is live from Djibouti. So um, we are excited to be talking to her from across the world, and she was a guest on the podcast last year after her first book came out. Um, I will link that um, episode in the show notes when I post this on the podcast, which this will be on the podcast, but probably not for a couple of weeks. So if you're here on Instagram Live, um, you are a special guest. So thank you for joining us. Rachel, thank you for joining me um, to talk about your new book. I keep, I have to look to see what it's called, Pillars, How Muslim Friends Led Me Closer to Jesus, which um, you had mentioned this book last time that we talked and I was already excited about it because um, there's obviously so much we can learn from the way other people do their religions, even if we don't necessarily um, believe in that same religion. And so tell us about the genesis of this idea and how you decided to write about it. Sure. So I live in Djibouti, which is like you said, where I'm calling from. And 99% of Djiboutians are Muslim. So all of my community, um, and, and I've lived here since 2004, so it's been a really long time. My coworkers, my neighbors, my shopkeepers, everybody is Muslim. And so Islam is just a part of my life. There's um, mosques that surround my neighborhood. There's the month of Ramadan that we just finished a few weeks ago that all my friends were fasting for 30 days. Um, and it, even just the language that people speak, they talk about Allah, they talk about going to Mecca on Hajj for the pilgrimage. So Islam is just a part of kind of the air I breathe here, I guess. But I'm an American Christian. And so as I started to think about all these practices were around me and how I engage in them in different ways, um, I, I wanted to write the story of what it looks like to live as a Christian in that context where I'm learning from my Muslim friends. I'm not becoming Muslim. They're not becoming Christian, but we're, we're talking about faith together and we're encouraging each other in our own faith. And so the book kind of came out of all that daily life experience. And also I feel like a lot of American Christians come to Islam or think about it with a sense of fear or misunderstanding. And I thought if I could just share my story of um, not needing to be afraid, that could help explain some things that would maybe take away some of that fear, take away some of that misunderstanding. So it's kind of a, a way for me to help people gently approach Islam and, um, and be able to see what there is in it that is good. What are some of the misconceptions that you see most from people in the West? <laughs> well, one of the most obvious ones, and this is, I don't know how common it is, but I get it a lot, where people think that I should really be afraid to be living around Muslims. And so I've even had people say to me, aren't you afraid that all those Muslims over there want to kill you all the time? And I thought, when people say that to me, I don't even know how to respond because how does a person live if that's really how you feel, that you really think everyone around you is trying to kill you all the time, that's a not healthy way to live, right? And so that idea that there's inherent violence or that there's a natural sense of aggression that people want to attack me, that is a really strong misconception. It's, it's something that I think people really do think, they say it to me, but it's also so not true. You know, it's something I really want to help overturn. Um, and there's other misconceptions too about how women are treated 
um, you know, about different things like that, that Muslims are poor or uneducated, something like that, which is just very untrue. And so, um, yeah, and even just that people, that Muslims are not actually people of faith. I think that's a, a very strong misconception that Christians especially would have, that they are, um, you know, not really practicing a religion that's legitimate. And so I wanted to counter that by showing, you know, my friends really have faith. They practice a sincere religion and they believe in God and they do these things that are meaningful to them. And so, um, yeah, all those are just some of the misconceptions that people have that I, I think are pretty easy when I can tell a story and show how I've encountered them to overturn. And when you look at the pillars that you wrote about, um, how have you been able to translate those into your own faith practices? That's a great question. So the first pillar that I write about in the book, and the first one that's kind of the foundational one is the Shahada. It's the creed or the statement of faith that you would say when you're becoming a Muslim. Um, and so I had not really thought about having a creed. I grew up in a Baptist tradition and so we didn't have a lot of liturgical practices. Um, and I didn't really think a whole lot about the idea that there are Christian creeds. You know, we have this idea of sort of the prayer, the sinner's prayer that some traditions would say makes you a follower of Jesus or makes you a Christian. But um, I haven't considered it in the sense of a creed that would tie us together globally as a Christian body. So that was something that thinking about this Islamic creed that Muslims say, every Muslim says it. Um, made me consider what are the creeds that I share with someone who's worshiping Jesus in Brazil or in Kazakhstan or in Minnesota. Um, and then other things like prayer. So the, the second pillar is this five times a day ritual of prayer that they will do. And there's a call to prayer that sounds from the mosque. And so I hear it five times a day. And then Muslims will um, they'll wash in very specific ways. And then they bow kneel, stand up again, and they recite these prayers in Arabic. And so from that, I really saw the beauty of using your body in prayer, um, which I know many Christians do, but it's not something that I had done very often. This idea that we can physically prostrate, put our forehead to the ground and feel the earth as we're communicating with God. That's been something that's um, really impacted me. So those are a couple of examples. And I want to ask you about... Um... Just, I, I think we talked about this in our last interview, but I, you know, we've got a lot of new people here. So I, I do want to ask you about, you know, looking at American Christianity from the standpoint of where you are, like you're not living in it, you're living away across the ocean from it. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you view that, um, the practice of Christianity in America today? Like, and how is it viewed, I guess, overseas? Like how are, how are Christians seen from afar? So I'll start with that second question. Um, Christians in general here in my context aren't something people think about very often. The majority is Muslim. There are three churches that actually have a building that the government allows to exist. There's a Catholic cathedral, a French Protestant church where my family goes, and there's an Ethiop Ethiopian Orthodox building. And so those buildings exist, but they're not very big. There's not a lot of people who go to them. So the assumption here at least if you're a local person, the assumption is that you're Muslim. And even for other people, the assumption is that you're either Muslim or you're some kind of um, rejecter of faith. I guess it's how they would consider anyone who's not a Muslim is that, that you're an infidel. Um, so there, I wouldn't say that they think a lot about like American Christianity, not here. I do, of course, as an American Christian, I think about American Christianity a lot um, because of my community on that side of the ocean. And so one thing I think that's become very obvious to us after living abroad for so long is some of the ways that culture is misconstrued as religion. And I just think that when you are in it, you can't see it. And that's okay. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But when the culture becomes um, something that we cling to as if it's a religion, um, that becomes a problem. And so I think some of the ways that we practice faith as Christians in America, even the structure of our services, that's not necessarily straight from the Bible, and there's nothing wrong with it, but we hold to that tradition. So when someone is worshiping in a way that looks different, authentically,
essential to our faith and what is cultural and how, how are they informing each other for, for better or for worse? And if it's for worse, how can we separate that out? And I would also, one of the things that I would want to encourage the American church about specifically is to consider and just to really be aware of not being the only church in the, in the world. There is a global body of believers that we are part of. Totally. And I think a lot of times American Christians can think they're the center. Their theology is the center and their ways of singing and ways of um, doing mission or whatever it might be is the center and the way it should be done. But there is a wide, diverse, beautiful, thriving global body that we're a part of. And so I just encourage American Christians to think about that. Yes, I'm so glad you said that because, oh my gosh, I, to, to think that we would be the center is just ridiculous. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, things don't look great for the West and the church and all of those things. But what, what I've been hearing is that the global church is thriving in a way that we're not here in the West. And so if anything, we should be looking outside of our boundaries to see how to sort of find that revitalization. Um, and I think you're so right on that point about culture. Like, it has become so overlapping that people don't know the difference. And, you know, it's like, it, it makes me think of things like, you know, when people are battling for religious freedom, which by the way, like I'm fully supportive of religious freedom. However, it becomes here in America, it has become almost like, sometimes it almost feels like it's the point instead of a, you know, sort of a side point or a secondary point. Um, and I think we really need to find those distinctions between what is culture, what is Christ, how can, and then that, um, you know, the whole concept of being in the world, but not of the world. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstanding about how that is supposed to work. So that's really interesting to have your perspective on that. Um, so how have you been able to get the book out there from afar? Have you been um, on a lot of podcasts? Are you able to travel? I know COVID probably made it weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, COVID made it weird. I wasn't able to travel this time. No, no traveling book tour. I've done a lot of podcasts, some interviews that Christianity Today review was really amazing. Um, we had a, a big launch event with the man who wrote the foreword. His name is Abdi Noor Iftin, and he's a Somali Muslim writer, along with Barbara Brown Taylor which was amazing to be able to be in conversation with them together. Um, so that oh was gosh, the big yeah, because, push to get it yeah. out. I was just going to say, because it reminds me so much of her book that she recently wrote um, about faith, about different kinds of faith. I forgot what it's called, but, um, but yeah, so good. That's amazing that you would get to collaborate with Barbara Brown Taylor. Yeah, it was. Sorry, it was I think I lost you for a second. Um, and so is it going well? Do you feel like it's resonating yeah. with people? Yeah, I feel like it is, you know, especially the people who live abroad, people who have experienced, whether they live abroad or maybe live in the United States, but have relationships with people across cultures. It's not just religion, but culture or faith. Um, I get a lot of feedback from people like that who feel like I'm putting words to what they've experienced and helping them to understand kind of some of the emotions that they've had and the frustrations of communicating that to people who don't understand it, um, they're really thankful. So the feedback has been incredible. Um, I do know that not every reader and not every um, Christian or even every Muslim is gonna agree with what I conclude in the book. Um, I do feel very comfortable with a lot of Muslim practice. Um, I'm very open to some of the ways that they believe and that they speak about faith. And so that makes some people very uncomfortable. And I'm aware of that and know some of the issues that can be raised. But I think what's important, even in that space, um, just as it is when I communicate interreligiously, to understand that we don't have to agree on everything, but that we're, we're all trying to figure out what it looks like to, to love Jesus, to love our neighbor, to follow God in this actual world. You know, and so in the middle of our disagreements, and if people don't agree, that's okay. I want to talk about those things and, and figure out together how to know God better. Yeah, and I mean, I know you're not there as a missionary, but um, 
you know, what a better way to get to know somebody as just for who they are than to, you know, really become knowledgeable about their faith and their life. And, you know, there may be an opportunity where you have a conversation with them or, you know, that's how God is working through you is just by you being there and being so respectful and so loving and so um, just inviting and uh, all of those things in, in relation to who they are, where they are, without any judgment or any pushing. And I think there's so much that God can do through that. And, and so, so much that we can learn just here. Um, you know, you don't have to be overseas in a Muslim country to, to embrace the uh, people around you for who they are without trying to change them and just love them. Um, I think so many times Christians are so concerned with, you know, witnessing or, you know, whatever that may look like. Um, when the best thing that you can do as a person is just love the person next to you for who they are, get to know their life, and that's how God works through you. Um, you know, as a kid, I, growing up in church, I always was, it was always just so much about like, you know, witness and share the gospel all the time. But it's like, that's not necessarily a tactic that's really going to be successful, like right, <laughs> right out the gate. Um, you, you have to sort of earn the privilege to share things like that. And you can't do that unless you truly love and know and respect somebody and they respect you back. So, um, I think, you know, this book could do so many things in that way as well. So, um, I know that I appreciate everything that you wrote in it and, and the reason behind writing it. And, um, I think it was such a, a wonderful idea and thank you so much for sharing today, Rachel. Is there anything else you want to share about the book or how people can get in touch with you? Um, I just hope that people will be willing, if they read this book, to consider how they can engage interreligiously, cross-religiously with other people. Ask good questions, be very curious, be very humble, and be very open to what they are willing to share with you. So don't water down your own faith. Don't expect them to water theirs down. And then engage each other. That's a really exciting way and place to engage um, when everyone can be very authentic about what they love and what they believe. So I encourage people to think about that as you read the book. And you can find me at um, all the social media places. Rachel Pye Jones is my, my handle on all the things. So I would love to, um, to connect. Okay. Yeah. I think stay curious is like the best phrase for all of life. So <laughs> um, I love that. Yes. Questions are always a good thing. And to be genuinely curious about someone else is going to go a long way. So Thank you so much. I'm glad we finally got our connection to work. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I'll thanks for persisting. Yes, I will link up your book and make sure we get it out there. And I hope that you're able to sell lots of copies and make it go a long way. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Thank so Bye.